Very good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aldrin Simpier. I will be the facilitator for this uh, conversation. We will be in conversation with um, Deputy Minister Nicola Kivet, Public Works Deputy Minister. And this is part of the Sustainable Infrastructure Development Symposium um, in South Africa. As you heard, the President also making his remarks early on, including the Minister of um, Public Works. So the theme of um, today's conversation is investing in infrastructure for shared prosperity now, next, and beyond. So introduction to the panelists who will be joining us for this conversation. As I've indicated, we have uh, the Deputy Minister, Nokolo Kivet, who will be part of this conversation. We also have Ms. Niva Machetla, Senior Economist, Trade Industrial Policy Strategies. We have Mr. Franz Baleni, the former NUM General Secretary at Petros or Chairperson as well. We also have Prof. Harun Barat, who is a member of the Presidential Economic Policy Advisory Council. We also have Mfundo Nkutu, who is, okay, so we're told actually that Mfundo won't be able to join us. Um, apologies for that. But uh, we have Dr. Miriam Altman, who is the commissioner at the National Planning Commission. So I'm going to start off with uh, the Deputy Minister just to welcome everyone and give us the opening remarks and then we'll go through the panelists and the panelists will give us their opening remarks. Just a quick reminder as well that um, any questions that you have and in comments that you have as well, right at the bottom of your screen on your left hand side or on your right hand side rather, if you click on the chat box, the chat box will open and that's where you can type in all your questions and those who are following us on Twitter, they can send us the questions and their comments using um, the at SIDSS handle, that is at SIDSS handle. So, Deputy Minister, let's start off with you. Thank you, thank you, Aldrin, and good afternoon to all our panelists. Um, as, as you have uh, enlisted them uh, in the various uh, areas of uh, importance. Uh, our participants uh, online at uh, their various uh, homes, uh, good afternoon to all who has made this day a, a reality. And allow me in appreciating this opportunity that has been presented to us to talk on the expanded public works uh, as, as a, a methodology or as a system which can be used in South Africa to create employment opportunities for people. Uh, we, we need to lock that against the backdrop of the, what we are holding today, uh, this, this uh, very important uh, symposium um, on, on seeds, which talk to infrastructure project pipeline. Uh, which the EPWP must uh, respond to. We are now about to discuss that and would want to remind all of us as leadership uh, in the country, in the various sectors that we operate in, that indeed our constitution uh, enjoins all of us in its preamble to improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. For me, that is profound when we are to talk about uh, employment opportunities and employment in general, uh, mm -hmm. because it talks to the core of ensuring that we contribute to that uh, South Africa which we would want to see, a South Africa uh, that is prosperous, a, a South Africa uh, which where everyone who resides or who is a, a citizen is um, free and, and the potential is uh, freed for that uh, individual. We are to talk about employment, which brings about dignity to each uh, person. We are to talk about employment in the talking against the backdrop of the National Development Plan, which uh, enjoins, again, all of us, as we all accepted and uh, adopted it as a campus, development campus for our country, which is now only left with only 10 years uh, to its end. We therefore must uh, gallop in terms of 
ensuring its implementation. And it calls on us to do a number of things. One, some of those that I will lift, uh, it calls on us to ensure that there's a social compact uh, to reduce poverty and inequality and to raise employment and investment. Now, you have aptly told us that we currently stand at almost 30% uh, mm. unemployment rate, which is going to rise uh, with uh, the aftermath of COVID-19. Already some companies are closing. Uh, mm. Some have closed uh, already, which is going to contribute a great deal also on the very high unemployment rate. Uh, then the NDP also talks to the strategy to address poverty and its impact on broadening access to employment, strengthening the social wage, improving public transport, and raising rural income. Um, we, we need to take steps uh, as, as government and as, very, as the various uh, sectors to professionalize uh, the public service and ensure that there's accountability and improving coordination and uh, ensure that you prosecute on corruption. These are steps that we all have uh, accepted uh, to do in the NDP. And they, 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 all of them talk to uh, contributing to reducing and fighting unemployment because we all understand a high rate of unemployment uh, brings about a high rate of crime, which all of us wouldn't want to see. A, a high rate of unemployment brings about dissent, citizen dissent, which is also that which we would not want to see. And therefore, in the context of uh, the seeds that we're talking about today, we, we are also talking to the public employment programs, um, which seek to say whatever uh, infrastructure projects we talk about, they must talk to job creation. When we talk economic recovery, it must not be only on, on financial terms. It must be economic re recovery, which is based, uh, which has as a component of it, uh, employment creation. It must be um, growth with jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore, it becomes important for uh, all of us as uh, various sectors to say, how are we going to ensure that we use the various met methods available at our disposal uh, in this uh, SEEDS program uh, to ensure that we, we grow uh, our economy ensuring that each individual's potential is freed and um, we are able to contribute to the prosperity that we would want to see South Africa moving towards. Understanding that we are coming, which we, we are now uh, experiencing the ravages of um, COVID-19, which contribute to job losses, we must find a way to up our game with respect to the public employment uh, targets. We must increase them and we must also find a way to hold hands with the private sector uh, mm -hmm. to ensure that employment uh, is created without uh, compromising uh, the quality of assets, without compromising uh, income security, um, we therefore need to ensure that the multi-sectoral investment uh, go ahead without compromising the human capital investment. So we talk um, skills development, we talk um, education, we talk uh, employment creation. That's a package uh, that we would want to look into this afternoon. Uh, and therefore, whatever jobs uh, programs we come up with, uh, especially with respect to EPWP, the skills transfer can never be overemphasized mm -hmm. because 
the EPWP provides opportunity, but by the time the individual that has participated in the program leaves the program, they must leave the program uh, well capacitated to better opportunities uh, and better prospects for full-time employment. Uh, we understand that EPWP is a means uh, to, to mitigate, actually, it's not even to fight poverty, mm -hmm. it is mitigating poverty, but we need a strategy that is going to work uh, for public employment, but also ensuring that uh, the programs that uh, private sector gets involved in are labor in intensive uh, projects. Should I stop there for now? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll ask you to stop there, <laughs> Deputy Minister. Uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Deputy Minister. Um, to the rest of um, our panelists, unfortunately, I won't be as generous with the time. So each person will only be getting three minutes to give our opening remarks, and we're going to start off with uh, Ms. Machet. Good afternoon. Apologies, I didn't know I was going first. <laughs> you can go ahead. <laughs> okay, and it's Dr. Machetu, by the way. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I, I think that in my three minutes, I come from trade industrial policy strategy, so we tend to see infrastructure very much in a developmental context, both in terms of how it contributes to industrialization, but also how it creates an inclusive economy, as the deputy minister said. Mm -hmm. From that standpoint, I think we need to start by being clear that the main way in infrastructure contributes to job creation and to equality is actually in terms of the kinds of infrastructure that are produced, for whom, and at what cost. That is, how much consumers pay. So in 2008, we also wanted to create jobs through infrastructure creation. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's much easier to fund and to develop conventional programs that serve big industries. So the really biggest projects that got completed with the ESCOM coal plants, the Transnet ore lines, and the San Ramal toll roads. And I think we will all agree that those things may have helped the large-scale formal sector grow in important ways when they worked, like the ore lines, but they didn't do much to create jobs. You can't create a whole lot of jobs building coal plants directly, and they didn't really support economic transformation in the sense of improving living standards for low-income communities or supporting small business. So I think when we talk about, so that's the first point, is when we talk about employment in infrastructure, we need to be clear that that's not the main aim and that we need to say, first, what is the, what's the kind of infrastructure we need and then how do we leverage it to create jobs? The second thing, though, is in terms of the kinds of infrastructure that will create jobs. You know, some kinds of infrastructure is much better for job creation than others. So rural roads are actually quite good for job creation and yeah. generally dirt roads as opposed to tar roads. Yeah? Um, even some kinds of home building is good for employment creation, but not if you're building even RDP houses because you need skills for that and it's quite formalized. So I think we have to be really clear that a lot of the infrastructure we want to generate, it's not about creating jobs directly, it's about creating jobs because of the way it promotes economic activity. And then when we look at employment schemes, generally internationally, the ones that have worked have generally not, have often not been around infrastructure the way we often think about it, like big classic infrastructure, but it's either been small scale rural infrastructure or social services and cultural activities. And often, and I think when um, Haroon talks, he's going to talk about the difference between the CWP and the EPWP. One of the things with the CWP is if it's community, do you structure it around community control or do you structure it around these are the projects we want? How do we get more people employed on them? So I think mm -hmm. those are the two dynamics for me that are particularly important when we talk about employment creation through infrastructure. One is, again, a lot of infrastructure is just not suitable for large-scale labor-intensive employment creation. We need to be clear about that. But the other one is, if we're serious about job creation, it's the downstream from in infrastructure that is critical in the long term, and not so much how labor-intensive are the projects to, when, we, when we actually build them. Thanks. Okay, great stuff. I think you had a couple of seconds left there, but you didn't. <laughs> <It's all fast. laughs> Let's uh, go to Mr. Franz Balevi, former NUM General Secretary and also Petro SA Board Chairperson. Good afternoon. 
Uh, good afternoon, sir. I will take some of the seconds uh, from Lima. Um, <laughs> all, all, all protocol observed. Um, the stage of unemployment requires drastic and pointed uh, measures. Um, and we need to be more practical and not to be theoretical. Uh, the first thing uh, which can create immediate jobs is the upgrading of the existing state enterprise infrastructure to produce and create more jobs. For example, if I may make an example about Petro SA, you expand the refinery to produce 46,000 barrel, barrels per day instead of 18. That in itself immediately create more jobs in the construction and, and as well as in the uh, production level. The gas mm -hmm. pipe, the conversion of uh, the aging coal power station into a gas plant uh, uh, so that you bring in the communities as you convert that old coal power station into a gas power. And some of the, uh, uh, given my experience in serving the board of DBSA, which does create jobs uh, in terms of infrastructure, road, as Eva has indicated, rail, we know that uh, we've got a problem of rail in South Africa, energy, uh, water, and the ports and ICT. And these infrastructure uh, already need to go beyond the borders because sometimes if we, we limit ourselves as South Africa, we then have invited the challenges of our neighboring countries. So we have a big project like North-South Corridor Road Rail Project. That needs to be pursued aggressively so that those jobs are created in the neighboring uh, countries. And our approach must also be tactical. We need to target areas of high unemployment. I mean, I look at uh, Ding Xiaoping, how he has handled reforms uh, in China. You go first where the severity of the problem is, uh, rural areas, urban areas, semi-rural areas. And I'm, I've, I've got a strong view that post public works must result to sustainable jobs. So because those, those who have been trained, it should not be a once-off 100% people must also be carried forward into new jobs. And, and the last two points, partnering with the private sector is critical. For these part type of jobs to be sustainable, we need social compact with labor, um, employers, government, and communities. I rest my case. Okay, let's go to, is it uh, Professor Borat, who's joining us also on the line, member of the Presidential Economic Policy Advisory Council. Uh, good afternoon, Prof. Uh, good afternoon, Aldrin. I have a presentation I wanted to share. Is it possible okay. to uh, allow sure. that? Sure. You can go ahead. Um, it's not allowing me to share content. If... Okay, let's just quickly see. Butumelo, can you quickly help us and assist us with that? Okay. Um, while Butumelo works on that, probably in the meantime, let's uh, let's go to uh, Dr. Dr. Marin Altman. Um, Dr. Merrin, good morning, uh, sorry, good afternoon and welcome uh, to this conversation. And uh, Dr. Merrin Altman is a commissioner at the National Planning Commission. Thanks. Um, and it sounds like uh, I thought I was being naughty with the things I was going to raise, but they're absolutely complementary to what uh, Neva and Franz have already said. Mm -hmm. Because the first point that we've got to think about and the biggest opportunity is at, in terms of job creation and stimulating the economy, of course, is the main infrastructure programs where, you know, 80% of the budget gets spent. So, you know, right there, there's an opportunity um, to be spending more municipalities where where the main job creation happens in infrastructure, uh, about 50% of the budgets get spent. So that that is the number one opportunity. And what I wanted to say about that is that um, the National Planning Commission has released uh, a number of papers recently. And in the chat room, um, I sent a note to everybody to, to show people where it is on, the, on state capacity to deliver infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. and on governance and, um, and performance of the key infrastructure SOEs using ESCOM, PROSA and TRANSNET as uh, case studies. So those have been those have been released on the NPC website, and again, I've offered the the link, and we seek feedback from from people. But you know, it's the number one thing that has to improve, which is that state that element of state capacity. The second mm -hmm. thing that, that's been raised by both speakers already is that um, the opportunity for job creation, specifically in maintenance and refurbishment, is really critical. It's something that some of us have been raising for years. And so the core, you know, although it's not as sexy and as exciting as some of the projects we're talking about, 
Um, the reality is that everything from rural roads, roads, general provincial roads, mm -hmm. to um, some some of the you know even historic public buildings are in a very bad state, and that is a huge job creation, uh, much more than than big infrastructure projects. That is a big job creator, and something that that's more small projects that, that are easier to do, faster to do, and they use up a lot of local materials. In, in the process of doing it. So they have really nice linkages. And it's something, as I say, that some of us have been pushing for many, many years um, to up those budgets and really increase the priority. And I, I really hope that the Department of um, Infrastructure and Public Works, or maybe it's Public Works and Infrastructure, I'm not sure. Um, Public Works and Infrastructure, isn't it? Um, will think that that is sexier than, than I think um, is currently thought. So, so the core activity of the Department of Public Works is something that you should, that, that the department should see as very sexy and very job creating and not underestimate because I think right now and for many years it's seen as kind of a poor sister to everything else. Then there's EPWP and I promise you I won't be much longer. Okay. So the You're National right. Development Plan said that EPWP or Expanded Public Works or, or whatever you want to call it community work mm -hmm. program, public employment programs, basically, should reach about half of all unemployed. And I guess we were hopeful that the economy was going to make progress. Mm -hmm. So the target in the plan was to have about 2 million. We didn't say it, but what we meant was 2 million full-time equivalents by 2020 or earlier was actually what the, what the NDP goal was with the idea that we would at least achieve the middle scenario. Now, unfortunately, we're on the low end scenario of the NDP. We're not on the middle one or the best one, we're on the worst one. And that means we probably have somewhere around six to eight million unemployed. Now, the, the current target for full-time equivalents um, is around maybe half a million a year. And what's being achieved is about 420,000 full-time equivalents a year. So we are falling very far short. Now, some part of that is about budgeting and a big part of it is about capacity. Mm -hmm. Now we argued quite a bit for social service and for the non-state sector aspects of EPWP to expand. That's partly because the cost per job is about 25 to 35,000 per FTE as compared to over 100,000 in infrastructure. They are generally contiguous opportunities. In other words, their construction tend to be short and environmental projects and care for children under four or home-based care tend to be lengthy opportunities uh, and very uh, gender oriented. In other words, women tend to get these opportunities okay. and they tend to be much more stable and they're less expensive per job opportunity, which means they're bigger job creators. Now, we obviously, we made a very big deal about it around ECD for under fours, home-based care, NSNP, um, community works program. Unfortunately, those programs have not expanded the way that one had hoped to get to the service delivery goals that, that one would want to see. And now we have additional opportunities around COVID, of course, home-based care. Uh, it would be great to be having health sanctuaries in townships. Uh, community support to be uh, physically distancing correctly, um, health support, uh, workplace support, and so on. Um, so, you know, there's no shortage of opportunity to fill service delivery gaps. But the problem is number one, budgets. And number two is, uh, is, is capacity, institutional capacity, which has been a problem for the past 20 years. And then yeah. finally, the ability to let go. So CWP was meant, really had a fantastic runway of opportunity for a period um, where it was expanding when the idea of letting local authorities or wards choose what they wanted to do. And very often it was these kinds of services. And the more there's a kind of control from the center, the less we find they expand. So to see these opportunities expand, we really need to start seeing um, more commitment to local activation, 
Now, one of the things, and I'll just close with this, one of the things that was tried that worked very well was also to give municipalities labor uh, incentives around these programs. So the more successful you are, the more money you get. And it encouraged uh, municipalities to do better. So I think we really need to start using some of those principles that we found worked to get these numbers up quickly. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let's uh, go back to Professor Borat. Great. Thank you very much, Alvin. I think we've sorted out the <laughs> sharing of screens. If you could just tell me if you can see this. Uh, let's see. Can you put it up? Um, no, we can't see anything. Okay, let me just try. Okay, thank you to the okay. That okay Doctor, uh, Prof can able to present now the... Okay. Yes, I've given him... It's loading, Prof? Yes. Can you see it now? Yes, yes, yes. we have it. Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you. Again to all panelists to please mute your mics. Great. Thank you, Aldrin. Can I proceed? Yes, Prof, you may go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. So I've just prepared about five or six slides, which I'll go through very quickly, just by way of background in how we think about public works programs. Uh, again, I'm sure the audience here is aware, but it's just useful to sort of pull us back a little bit. There are two key components to our public works program in South Africa. There's the expanded public works program, which started in 2004, and then much uh, later, or well, five years later, a community works program, which was which is now still in place, but they are very. The public works program is the classic, if you like, provision of infrastructure, and ideally trying to crowd in private sector investment and then employment creation uh, as an outcome. Mm -hmm. The community works program is what is internationally known as an employment guarantee scheme. So what it offers is if you look at the bottom there, it guarantees 100 days of work, work to participants. The kind of provision of infrastructure is more community linked. And crucially, if you look in the middle there, non-wage costs are limited to 35% of total costs. And I'll come back to what all of this does. Expanded public works have been tremendously successful in my view in the South African context. These are the employment creation, we call them work opportunities, but uh, essentially employment creation numbers over the period since 2004, you see it. It peaks at 1.1 million jobs in 2014, then there's a significant dip. And I'd like a discussion in this panel about why we saw this significant drop. Um, but crucially, an average of about 650,000 jobs were created since 2004. Um, the job generation rate reaches 5% of, of total employment, which I think is uh, incredibly uh, positive. And I'll again, look at the international comparisons. Mm -hmm. if you look at What did we say percentage of government expenditure? 1.8%. We need to look at what the new provisions are, but as a share of GDP, only 0.59%. So that's the expanded public works program. We move to the community works program, a much smaller program. Even though we guarantee 100 days of work, the average is about 162,000 jobs over the, over the period, as opposed to the 600 odd that we saw earlier for uh, mm. expanded public works. Um, its peak was reached, you can see here in the graph, and we can make this available, its peak was sort of in 2013, 2014, sorry, uh, 2016, 2017 of 243,000 jobs. Um, constitutes only about a fifth of the size of uh, public works programs in terms of employment, that is 1.1%, and has created a total of 1.3 million work opportunities, mainly to young people and women. Mm -hmm. It's total expenditure is much smaller, both in public expenditure terms and as a share of GDP. Arguably, though, far more labor intensive, right? And far more community focused. So how do we compare? Because I think that sentence is really important on that slide, is that you are competing in the space with other active labor market programs. And here, here's a really important graph, because what we try and do, and these are dollarized, but we can make it into RAND terms, it's fine, but it's the same story, which is if you look at public work, expanded public works programs, and over here, the Employment Guarantee Scheme, which is the Community Works Program, what you see essentially is that the cost per beneficiary, right, the cost of a job, if you like, is the highest in uh, the expanded public works program. And you see the notes on the side here. Even though we've created these large, largest, large number of work opportunities, that's the line graph, right? Uh, the cost is very, very high. The community works program is far less costly and has created fewer jobs, right? 
But here's an interesting one, what you're competing with. We just take a, a like for like in the active labor market program sense is that the wage subsidy, both the cheapest and has generated the largest number of jobs. What has happened in terms of our active labor market program space, because here is where we have to locate this work. Um, essentially, public works program have been the only game in town until 2014 when the ETI, as we call it, the wage subsidy scheme comes into place. And, mm -hmm. and then starts taking up more and more fiscal space, as well as being a far bigger, uh, but let's say supporting more jobs relative to public works programs. And I think that's a debate then about the choice we have in the toolbox if we are talking about active labor market programs generally, of which public works are one. We've only just introduced the wage subsidy or the ETI, so we need to have a debate possibly about Community works programs, expanded public works programs, and then um, the ETI. How do we compare relative to other countries? We always beat ourselves up, right? But in fact, we do really, really well. As a share of GDP, if you look at us compared to Latin American countries or other middle income countries, we spend an incredibly high proportion of GDP. That's the line graph. In fact, the highest in the sample, even though Brazil uh, on a PPP basis spends more than us, we spend as a share of GDP far more than Brazil in terms of um, uh, active labor market programs, generally of which public works are, 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 are the dominant uh, expenditure. So just the final slide, here are some of the challenges. I think Neva, Miriam, and France, in fact, picked up on all of them. There's a constant challenge between the trade-off of providing poverty relief, skills development, improvement of livelihoods, all wrapped up in some sort of infrastructure provision. I think we have to really keep an eye on what we're trying to do with public works and what we're trying to achieve. The inability, second challenge, to convert work opportunities into sustainable long-term employment. I think that's exactly what France referred to. 100 days of employment guarantee, if it doesn't generate or doesn't convert itself into permanent employment, we need to look at that. Final mm -hmm. two points is constant co concern. The community works program has been stalled uh, at, at the, uh, if you like, at the doorstep of rampant corruption uh, at the local level. And I think we have to be exploring that. And linked to that is you've got to set up proper monitoring and evaluation systems before you run this program. So before we go into these new sort of um, uh, post-COVID kind of expenditure patterns yeah. around public yeah. works programs, make sure we have proper m &E. Thanks very much. Okay, I think, uh, Prof, with, with that said, um, and let me go to uh, Dr. Macheta on this. With that said, the point that was uh, made by Dr. Altman about the capacity of the state. So even if we do speak about a post-COVID-19 uh, economy and post-COVID infrastructure um, program, for instance, we need to speak about the capacity of the state. Where would you say, Dr. Macheta, are the issues when it comes to the capacity of the state or its inability? Yeah, I'm thinking maybe we should be talking rather about where do we know there is capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the problems with infrastructure, and I do think this issue is saying we need to learn from our very big infrastructure program after 2008-2009. So one of the problems is when you have large sums of money floating around, it becomes very tempting for people to misdirect it. But I think a lot of the times when we're talking about a lack of capacity, it's linked to the state capture issue. Having mm -hmm. said that, I think that what we have seen works is community-based public employment schemes and generally where you set up infrastructure systems to be more accountable. We need some very big national programs. There's no question about it. The question is, how do you ensure that there's oversight and support? But we also need much smaller scale programs. And there to me, the question is, how do you decentralize control so that the mm -hmm. people who are supposed to benefit from them are actually able to oversee the um the production and that so you can do an outcomes based approach and intervene when things are going wrong the one other thing i would say is this part of what happened with the 2008 2009 build program was except for the 2010 stadiums yeah. you know things would be going wrong there would be delays there was no decisive intervention so i think one of the key issues is to say how do you set up a system that will ensure that when it's clear that the outputs are not where they should be something is actually done and then finally, one last thing, I am taking now my own extra seconds, is um, <laughs> that part of the issue is that the public service is designed to be risk averse. It's designed to say, we don't want to misspend the people's money. You know, we, we put in all these controls. It's not because we like bureaucracy, it's because we want to make sure that people are actually acting on mandates oh. and not stealing the money. 
But I mean, the outcomes and most of, of exactly. <laughs> well, I'm not saying it actually works, but I'm saying, and the argument is tended to be, therefore, we need to have bright lines. We need to not put money into things that are new and different. We need to do the things we know how to do. You'll never get a transformed economy or society doing that. So I think we also need to say, if we're serious about using infrastructure to transform things, for instance, they were talking this morning about to get rid of pit toilets, you know, to improve infrastructure in townships, to support township mm -hmm. enterprise. We need to mm -hmm. find a way exactly that to say, how do we take these risks without just throwing the money away? So we need to be prepared for some failures, but how do we ensure that we minimize them? And that requires much stronger risk management systems that are flexible and able to respond to the conditions as they change. Mm -hmm. So I think otherwise we end up again, like we did in the last big bill program, where those kinds of programs actually be made very rudimentary. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah, Dr. Altman, your, your, your take on that? Look, uh, I agree with Neva to say where, you know, where is the capacity, but the reality is that the state has lost enormous amounts of capacity. Uh, the economic cluster and cabinet have agreed that, can you hear me? So, sorry, Dr. Altman, when you say the state has lost a lot of capacity, are you basing this based on skills? Yeah, a feature of state capture was the hollowing out of capacity across government. So we, we needed, we, we still, we were building capacity 10 years ago and a, and, a, and a specific feature, you know, corruption doesn't necessarily lead to undermining capacity, but it was a feature of state capture in South Africa, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And you can't deliver without leadership and capacity. It is simply impossible to do. So this is why the National Planning Commission has been focused on this question of, so when we talk about leadership governance, uh, and capacity for delivery, what exactly do we mean? Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's why we put shoulder the wheel around, um, around this project uh, that we did on infrastructure delivery that focuses on procurement capacity, um, the, the, the capacity of the state to manage uh, the built environment. And we need to do similar work. We didn't look at EPWP, but we need to do similar work around these other kinds of areas around refurbishment and um, EPWP type of arrangements. And again, yes, there has been expansion of, of corruption in CWP, but CWP was moving beautifully when, when it started. Uh, we have to ask what happened to it and how do we get it back on track? It was a fantastic program that, mm -hmm. that we need to be moving again. There is nothing that is gonna replace the need across government. You know, that idea mm -hmm. that number one priority which cabinet says is, is their number one priority is building state capacity yes. should actually be our number one priority at this point. Mm -hmm. We really and need to get this capacity state, in place. Uh, how do you build that state capacity? Well, you, you, and you know, on some levels like COCTA, uh, back to basics program says the top six in municipalities are supposed to have certain capabilities. Now people lock into their positions and it's very hard to dislodge people, but you could say, pick the top 25 where, you know, or I forget what it is, but 25 to 50 municipalities where 80% of the population live. I forget what the number is, but it is possible to do that. So less than 50 municipalities where 80% of the population live, uh, where most of the GDP is, and make sure that those municipalities have three years to align to the back to basics program. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Now that requires a certain amount of political will because we know there's a lot of patronage in local yeah. government, right? And mm -hmm. you have a lot of appointments, not everybody, but you've got a lot of appointments of people who just don't have the capacity to drive these infrastructure programs. You know, 50% of capital budgets in municipalities are spent, mm -hmm. right? So not all of this is corruption. Some part of this is just not being able to get to it. Because mm -hmm. why would somebody underspend? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It's about revenue collection. It's about service delivery and, and, and know-how. So, um, you know, so I would have said, give them three years to align to the back to basics program. It's not a new program, so they should already know. And then you, and then, and then uh, there needs to be a strong stomach sure. in relation to the political fallout that happens with that. And that's true right across the board. And, you know, it's not always about, about having a degree as well. You know, it's about having some track record and, and ability to, you know, track record and delivery is, mm -hmm. is really 
I, I don't think it's about having a PhD or, or, or even a university degree necessarily, just to say, but that you've got some commitment and track record in delivering should mm -hmm. even be uh, good enough for some of these roles, maybe not a CFO, but sure. in some of these roles that should be good enough. But we're not we're not holding to account. So this is what we were trying to do around um, ESCOM, PROSA, and Transnet, which are you know really critical to, to to advancement of the country. Is to say, if you were delivering to the NDP, what would that look like at a very granular mm -hmm. level? How would you tie these SOEs to that performance? What would the governance look like? What sort of leadership mm -hmm. on the board and executive management? What should that look like? Now, unfortunately, we have very uh, what do you call it? constantly changing and, and stable executive mm -hmm. management and and board oversight and a lack of commitment to uh, managing these programs and it, according to good governance principles. Similarly, CWP, and I'm sorry, I'm just a I was a huge fan of CWP <laughs> when it was brought in because you know, at what point do you just say, maybe people at award level know what they need, let them yeah. frame what they need and you know yes you hold them to account and you may lose some of the money but you lose some of the money anyway but mm -hmm. the program was expanding very fast and very effectively and again often it was the social services that were that were being delivered that that's what people wanted um let them say what they need and what they want you know you don't always have to design everything from high on top <laughs> If you want to get delivery on scale, you better let go a little bit. I can't hear Aldrin. Um, I can't hear at all on my side. I don't know others. Yeah, I can't hear either. I thought it was mine. Lost you. We've lost you, Aldrin. Oops. No, it's still not coming. Uh oh. Franz, you have to chair us now. As the most senior <laughs> member of our panel. <laughs> you, you are the right person to chair. Okay. <laughs> We, we do can you do anything about this? Uh, because um, we can't hear uh, Alvin. We do can you hear me? Yeah. Is there any way to we can attend to this problem? Karin, I can't hear you. So we seem have, we have lost Aldrin. I'm not sure if you can be assistant or one video. Oh, is it Aldrin that is lost? Okay, just a moment.
while we're waiting, Prof, um, I like your presentation, especially uh, making a distinction between public works, uh, expanded public works, and uh, community works program. Very interesting. Thanks, thanks, Pansa. Um, Tumi's got a copy of it, so and I'm happy to send it through to you. But I mean, Neva and I were chatting Hello. earlier, just saying that I think we have to decide. I mean, if we're just talking public works, forget the ETI for now, just this differentiation and how we want to split it. I mean, in Miriam's. Harun? I think there was a departmental switch and then corruption and so on. So, yeah. 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 It's when it was moved. One of the questions we should be the share of expenditure between uh, uh, yeah. okay. are we still in a session yes dr altman aldrin is back hello aldrin can you hear us sorry doctor is one of those technical issues Hello, Aldrin. Okay, let me try to. Okay, they are calling me. Let me just uh, try to. I see there's a question here from the uh, uh, questions here. I'm not sure who wants to take it while we're waiting. Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Anybody want to take that question? On foreign investment, which one? Foreign investment. Are you asking me to do it? Yes, while we're waiting, so then we're not losing time. Okay, sure. I think, you know, I think it's a very simple thing. There's definitely uh, uh, potential, and we should be welcoming foreign direct investment into um, major infrastructure programs. And it is something that we do think about. You know, for example, when we get Chinese investment in rail or Maybe that's a bad example, but um, uh, you know uh, the renewables program is another example. Um, I think EBWP, however, is generally a publicly funded uh, program because there there just aren't those returns, you know. The, the, the other point which was raised uh, towards the end um, before we lost Aldrin was the issue of, of, of lack of capacity. Um, in some instances, I have picked up that it is by design uh, so that there's leakages and so on. For example, where capacity is available and can be sourced from state enterprises. I know, for example, DBA, DBSA in building schools. Um, and the provinces were very reluctant because it means that there will be no opportunity uh, to take away some, some of these resources. Um, so uh, sometimes it is, it is by design that there's lack of capacity, not that it cannot be acquired or it cannot be uh, sourced internally within the state. Maybe I should utilize the opportunity to share what we are doing around the issue of this uh, capacity, especially in the built environment, uh, looking at the skills, uh, the infrastructure pipeline. We, we are matching 
a we are, in fact we are creating a database of um, the various skills that you need in the built environment and we are taking especially from our councils those people who are who are registered with the councils but who are never employed or those students and those students who come straight from university and we would want to partner them with um, the retired um, engineers and and uh, all those uh, skills in in the built environment those people that have uh, retired uh, we will group them so that they mentor uh, this, the, the, the retired ones mentor the new um, uh, entrance into the, 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 the environment. We're doing that because we've realized in, in many of the projects that are already up and running, uh, we spend so much uh, because either the infrastructure will not be completed on time or if it is completed on time um, the prices uh, have grossly changed oh, during the, the process of uh, um, building such uh, projects and we're trying to then say how do we ensure that we we, we enhance the capacity of the young ones, the new entrants, um, also contributing thereby to youth development and utilizing the skills uh, of the, your engineered um, specialists into the, 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 the field, um, matching them with the new entrants. We think that will go a long way in addressing, uh, especially in the built environment, the, the skills um, capacity. But with respect to governance, um, the School of, Gov of Governance uh, has been in operation now. Um, and I think it, there are some changes and improvements that are taking place, albeit at a very slow uh, pace, because we now need uh, to gallop if we are to um, if we are to speed up uh, in the manner we should uh, the built environment the soft skills social skills also um, I, I heard our panelists I think it was uh, Dr. Almat if, if, if I'm not making a mistake uh, talking about opportunities brought about by the COVID-19, the social skills, um, the home-based cares and the, and the like. That work is already taking place with respect to EPWP. We have uh, currently um, 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 uh, appointed almost 23,000 EPWP workers to work with the Department of Health uh, in the, and as well as in the schools reopening program. We're using and utilizing EPWP workers. These are people that were recruited just uh, in this last month. So we, 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 I agree there are opportunities there. All we need is to uh, ensure that we, we do not waste time in, in ensuring that uh, work does take place. For me, the solutions in, in these programs are not only, uh, do not only lie with government. Uh, I think uh, Comrade Franz has said this so many times that uh, we need that partnership, um, pu private public partnerships are the way to go if, if we are to realize uh, any success with respect to dealing with the challenge of uh, um, the high unemployment uh, we are experiencing as a country. I'm not sure if, um, because I saw something that says Al uh, Altrin has uh, 
joined us. Am I alone in that? I've not seen. Uh, Deputy Minister, can you hear me? I'm, I'm back. Okay, I'm I'm back now. I'm back now. Okay, I don't know what I missed, um, but I think I'll just <laughs> I'll just go ahead and ask um, the other question that was, and this was an issue that was raised by uh, Dr. Machete about when we speak about these EPW jobs and we speak about them um, high impact um, infrastructure build projects and so forth. What type of infrastructure build projects are we speaking about here? Um, and linking them to these job opportunities. Uh, Mr. Balen, you can go ahead and, and answer the question. Thank you, Alden. Um, just an update, we did ask um, respond to one of the questions on the foreign okay. direct investment. Okay. And right. the minister also, deputy minister addressed us on the capacity. Um, Thank you. The road, road is one of the uh, serious job creation uh, infrastructure and it does create sustainable jobs after that because the road must be maintained one way or another mm -hmm. so it's um, a, a rain um, the energy energy space you look at uh, in the beginning the IPPs will create a larger volume of jobs as well as uh, these other forms uh, of energy but when it comes to maintenance there will be a, a, a fewer jobs um, mm -hmm. Uh, infrastructure such as ports, you know, they have a sustainable job. Yes, in the beginning, to expand the ports, um, it, it creates temporary uh, uh, jobs. But uh, in the build up, as the port is operating, uh, you've got traffic, you've got volume coming in. And then you go to the local municipalities and the rural areas. There are a number of such jobs which can be, um, be sustainable. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, uh, Professor Borat, can you answer that question? But looking at the slide that you just shared with us earlier on, um, where were those jobs coming from? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's so one of the challenges we find even on the data side, um, and again, I can share the detailed paper on this, which looks at all the active labor market programs, is that it's quite difficult to get a, a proper registry of um, allocations of expenditure. Uh, you can sort of get it by province, but it's then much, much harder to get it at sort of sectoral level or um, project level. And I think, you know, it again, just points to the importance, you know, uh, it was a, it seemed like an esoteric researcher type point asking for um, impact evaluation or monitoring and evaluation type of work. Mm -hmm. That's part of how you actually can understand well. Which sectors or industries did we target, and what was the multiplier effect? Which um, uh, which uh, provinces, perhaps, or even uh, broader, if you like, um, infrastructure needs were covered, whether it was water or um, rail infrastructure, whatever the case may be. And then you you can do proper analytical work to look at the employment multiplier effects, the growth effects, and so on. Um, we don't we we actually i mean you know in trying to co even compile the data that i've provided was incredibly difficult to just sort of put it all together and i mean that would be my uh, really request uh, uh to to the department to actually make sure that you build that expertise in or in fact make sure that you have the systems in place to collect that kind of data remember mm -hmm. with the m e stuff with the monitoring and evaluation Parliament and on Parliament and so on, it actually acts as a buffer or as a protective mechanism against corruption and leakage. So that's the other thing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I agree, there's a much broader, um, uh, more careful discussion that needs to be had in which we twin our growth needs for labor intensive, inclusive growth to the kind of infrastructure we're going to provide. Mm -hmm. I worry a lot about running to the next big supposed infrastructure project without thinking about the broader picture with respect to how this fits into an inclusive growth trajectory, say, for example, that um, in improves, I'm just throwing out things, improves the efficiency of ports, mm -hmm. make sure that uh, rail infrastructure has been built up. Mm -hmm. And that all in and of itself must be must fit into a broader inclusive growth strategy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Mahatla, how does it do that, considering, for instance, the announcement that came from the ANCs 
Economic Transformation Subcommittee that um, infrastructure would be a major focus to try and help boost the economy. But then in the absence of um, empirical evidence around um, how EPW has really assisted, um, it becomes really difficult if it's not industry targeted. So if you say, for instance, that um, we will be focusing our infrastructure in this specific industry, how do you do that when you know that when you don't know um, what the evidence um, is already? Yeah, I think, I mean, maybe I misunderstood. I thought what Harun was saying is we can't really fine tune the impacts of some of these measures. Having said that, I don't think anybody is saying the EPWP doesn't contribute. I do think there's an issue that the expectations have been very high for it and its ability to expand may be limited. Whereas if we're serious about public employment schemes, something like the uh, community work program, which is community based and just says, in effect says, we're going to prioritize job creation. It will be subsidized by the state and it will create some um, services or infrastructure for communities. But a key aim is to create jobs. So that's, it's much easier to expand that. I think um, Miriam also said this that it's much easier to expand that in ways that will create jobs. And that the risk, is it okay? Yeah, that the risk of, of focusing on infrastructure and tying it to job creation on the construction side is you can lose track of the fact that the main way that infrastructure contributes to job creation is by providing services that support economic activity. And in that, from that standpoint, if we're serious about inclusive growth, we need to ask much more consistently who gets the infrastructure, how does it support the economic activity, who benefits, and also is it affordable? Because we've tended to say we have to have world-class infrastructure, then it's not affordable, and the businesses that need to use it are unable to afford it, so it doesn't actually help. So to me, if we're serious about job creation, we need to look at, for infrastructure, the first prize is that the infrastructure itself is sustainable and helps producers do better and helps communities engage better in economic, in the economy. And that after that, we can look at, does it create jobs? And I don't, I mean, I'm assuming who wasn't saying we don't want infrastructure to, you know, maximize employment creation and construction where possible. I think he was saying that we need to put in the kinds of oversight systems that will let us measure when we're effective or not much better. Talk. Have we lost Aldrin again? What's happening? Uh oh. Aldrin is experiencing um, network problems. Uh, can uh, Neva Maketa continue? And then I will just sort it out from my side. Thank you. I mean, I think I, I, I had pretty much said what I wanted to say, Haroon. I don't know if you want to add anything or Miriam. I would ask both uh, uh, France and well, all of you, France, Miriam, uh, Neva, and the DM. I mean, I, I, it's not clear in my mind that we've twinned an inclusive growth strategy to a public works program. Um, it seems like the two live separate lives and they sort of have an energy of their own, the public works programs. And, and I'm, as Neva says, I'm truly supportive of both the CWPs and the EPWPs. I just don't. I would like to know if we were that statement and if so, how do you build that bridge? Yeah, Prof, I, I, I agree with you. I, I don't see it as, as it stands that um, it does address the element of inclusive growth. Um, I was in another platform um, yesterday on this issue of inclusive growth. And, and I'm proposing that um, given the current challenges of COVID-19, many companies are going under. Instead of allowing those companies to be uh, liquidated and jobs are lost, uh, maybe through the support of the state or state entities, that these companies are funded and saved, but on condition that uh, workers are allocated a state a stake uh, be 30 percent or whatever and the company gets to profitability 
uh, that debt is serviced and the money is paid back. So at the end of the day, you, you've got all of a sudden workers who are shareholders, 30 or 40 percent, and that will be in perpetuity, and it changed um, the economic effect that's a big time. Yeah, I mean, I agree. There's, there's, so that's, to, so that's a growth trajectory, right? So what you're suggesting is a model where you pick up those distressed sectors or do, those distressed firms, and that's how you incorporate them in some sort of public works program. Um, and I think that's, that's absolutely fine. At least it's linked to a growth trajectory. I, I just worry that we, in the sort of not random, but it's very much programmatic basis in which we're looking at infrastructure. But maybe I'm wrong. I'm not sure you that know, I understand oh. if, I, if I could just come in, which is that, um, you know, this, there's many things that we need to do to strengthen the economy and create shared growth. But this particular session was about public employment programs, as I understand it. And, um, and uh, you know, shared growth is partly about um, sharing the gains. And the reality is that, um, in middle income countries, particularly in higher income countries around the world, uh, it's very hard to square uh, the employment uh, uh, objectives that countries may have. And so that's where the state steps in. It may be through um, expanded state employment uh, in some countries. It may be through public works um, and other kinds of opportunities, youth programs and whatever. Um, but that is part of the shared growth uh, story, which is that you're ensuring that there's full employment. And then the choice is to make sure that whatever people are doing is something that's useful. And in this case, like the deputy minister was referring to, um, you know, placement of people to support uh, back to school and, um, you know, early child development uh, services for, for children under four, age four, uh, as, an exam as examples those fill a service delivery gap. So that is part of a shared growth story. No? I mean, that's Sorry, the point. Yeah, yeah so, oh, so I, don't, oh. I don't think we disagree as much as, no? yeah. Sorry, somebody wanna come in? Sorry, I thought I saw Aldrin come in, am I? Um, so, Maria, my point was simply, you know, if we if we have a particular vision about labor intensive infrastructure that's tied to a growth trajectory, why not wrap the public works program in there? I, I, it's not clear to me that we've done that adequately, but as I say, maybe maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I understand the basics of what we're trying to do, you know, in a full employment economy with public works and so on. I just don't see how, for example, you know, there's lots of discussions about uh, transport infrastructure all of what needs to happen in the ports in rails um uh and 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 yet that seems somehow separated from a public works program discussion and it's not clear to me that it should be it's not that the public work should always and everywhere be the answer to uh, infrastructure-led growth but it certainly there needs to be a closer link and i guess that was the point i was making but sorry i see we have our chair back can i oh do we have our chair back Okay. Aldrin, you're back. Aldrin is here, but the problem is the is the, is the volume. He can't hear us, but we are trying to sort that okay. out. I think the okay, session so will continue. Then while we are sitting, Aldrin, thank you. See, I, can I just add? I think in terms of what everyone's saying, so that to me, there's two issues here. The one is. There's a really big difference between small scale infrastructure and as Miriam said, maintenance and so on to serve communities directly. And the large scale bulk infrastructure um, that you need, for instance, when you fix the ports. And I just think we need to be clear that it's the small scale reticulation at community level that often provides more scope for employment creation directly in the construction side. And part of what I think we need to learn and I'm sorry to keep coming back to it, but I really think we need a proper analysis of what happened after 2008-9 with our last big build program, which is that we didn't get those small scale programs in at the scale we had hoped. There were some, 
But those are the ones that keep lagging because those are actually in many ways the hardest to manage and to fund because you have communities that can't afford to pay. Whereas if you look at things like the ports, you know, the mining companies were happy to pay for, you know, the coal lines and the ore lines and the formal sector in general can pay for improvement to the Durban Harbor. But when you say we want to put a school in a rural area, it's quite hard to mobilize the resources. And then you also don't have capacity there to build it. So I think transformation by definition is harder than past dependency. And part of what I think is reflected in terms of what Haroon was saying is we don't actually have a program now that says how are we going to get away from that past dependency so that we can ensure the infrastructure creates jobs both through public works, but also in terms of the kinds of services that are provided and whom they are provided to. Talk. Haroon, do you want to facilitate while we wait? Uh, you want me to facilitate? Okay, great. Um, but I think we haven't heard from France. I'd like France to come in on this. No, no, no I, I did make a point. Uh, I, I agree uh, uh, with you. I think it's not structured to really to focus on inclusive growth. It seemed to be more about how do we create a, a, a jobs uh, in the current uh, crisis uh, and while dealing with the uh, with infrastructure? And we can we can find a way of packaging it in such a manner that it, 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 uh, it turns around inclusive growth. Mm -hmm. Maria? Uh, prof, prof, maybe I also need to add. Yes. Because yes. uh, I yes, stopped uh, somewhere to say that this project of um, the skills I was talking about in the built environment, it is intended to ensure that, um, especially in your township uh, upgrade programs, um, which are in the skills in the infrastructure pipeline, those projects you, we we will utilize the combination of the EPWP non-skilled um, workers uh, to be supervised by the new entrants who are also supervised by your retired uh, um, experienced uh, people. That is going to help us have projects in our townships, uh, in, in the rural areas, which yes, have an economic impact in terms of uh, road infrastructure, stormwater drainage, uh, all those kinds of projects to be performed by EPWP workers uh, who would be undergoing training because by the time a project would be finished, if say we were paving a road and we had employed a person to pave the road for a year, by the time the, that project finishes, that person has the skill and can be accredited for that school and can be employable in a company elsewhere uh, and can exit the EPWP to be employed elsewhere and new entrants come into the, the fold. So that's, that's really what we're trying to do because we, have, we believe that will have an impact first on the on what we are currently paying in professional fees, uh, which most of our projects, would, we would uh, spend a lot of money on the facilitation of a project before the actual work uh, is done. Uh, we, we're trying to manage those issues, but also ensuring that uh, we, we free this potential of uh, these individuals, especially uh, the young people, because uh, young people who are unemployed uh, can, can be a threat to the free uh, state that we, we, and to the very economy uh, that is already a youth. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me now? I'm back. Apologies. Yes. 
thank you. Oh, great. Welcome back, Adrian. Great. <laughs> thank you so much. Apologies. And Prof, you did well. So I'll be co-hosting my talk radio show with you now. <laughs> no, absolutely not. I'm I'm the I'm the person who's most happy that you're back. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I don't know if we've touched yet on um, the public-private partnership when it comes to EPW and how do we do that? And Prof, let me start off with you. Um. So again, you know. Uh, I'm sorry to sort of come back to the story of, uh, and maybe I can just put it a bit more bluntly. If we had, you know, a, uh, a million rand available for public works programs or public employment schemes, let's call them that. Um, if you look at the cost per job of an EPWP versus a CWP, the yeah. simple thing is that it's much cheaper to create jobs through a CWP. Once you're in that game, and that's your, if that, if our goal is pure labor intensive growth or let's say employment generation, then actually CWP is the way to be going, except if we think infrastructure is far more important in the, how we think about inclusive growth. Both of those are really important avenues to think about because they will then modulate the kind of pub, public private partnerships you have. In the, NG, in the CWP sense, the private partnership, if you like, is really with the community. It's with um, NGOs um, and so on. Whereas in the PWP sense, it's a much larger sort of, if you like, a, a bit more mm. classic sort of whether it's with uh, foreign investors, domestic investors, or even private construction companies. And I think for me, it really depends on which avenue we're taking. But but I, mm. I mean, I think the other panelists here have much a much better sense of how the different models of public-private partnerships are likely to work um, uh, in this domain. Thanks. Okay, let, let, let's start off with um, uh, Mr. Balin. Thanks, um, uh, Aldrin, and thanks, Abeg. Uh, some of the uh, public-private uh, projects which can, in the form of public works, if you take um, the, ra the rail, um, it is on demand, in terms of goods and so on. So it becomes mm -hmm. much easier uh, to get the private sector to be on board. As um, Niva has indicated, same applies uh, uh, to, to ports. You can bring the private sector very easy, including roads, uh, so to speak. You know, with a mining background, I know uh, companies are struggling with bad roads. So mm -hmm. they want to have quality of roads and they will partner uh, with government and have this project to, to roll out. And I must also indicate that um, for the private, it's not in the interest of the private sector to have this scourge of unemployment not to be attended to because it makes the environment to be not to be conducive because people become restless. And so it's better for them to also participate and deal with the problem so that the business mm -hmm. can operate in a normal environment. Thank you. Do, do those companies then bear the cost of, of the labor as well? Mr. Balin? Yes, 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 they do. They do. Yeah. And, and what would the ratio be? It, de it depends from project to project where uh, the government comes in and the private sector sometimes could be more. You will find actually those participating in such a public and private uh, uh, project, they get better paid than your normal, pure, expanded public works. That, that's what mm -hmm. I've seen in some of the projects. Okay, and uh, Dr. Altman, your take on that, on the public-private uh, partnership? In public works or in infrastructure? In Excuse public works. Yeah, I don't. I, I think I, I think there's no doubt that you could have um, public-private uh, partnerships, particularly if um, you know one is widening out. Uh, you know how they're defined. Um, it's just that we have to remember what they are. Um, yeah. You know, there, and it's always it's always a, a challenge, which is um, like when you have service workers sir, uh, working on national school nutrition program, as an example. What makes them different than somebody who's just employed by that program, mm. or a cleaner? You know, a, a municipal cleaner. Uh, at what point are you an EPWP worker as compared to? A public service worker, and at what point are you a construction worker who's working on a pro a project that a 
private sector company got a contract for as compared to you know your common garden construction worker um mm -hmm. is, is always a question yeah. so you know the reason that you do these programs is because you know that number one you've got a service delivery gap and secondly in particular you have an employment gap if you had a choice you would rather they were uh you know higher paid public employee employees offering the service the problem mm -hmm. is that we have millions of unemployed and this is a trade-off that you know unions and many people struggle with but the reality is that um we have millions of people to try to draw into some kind of activity and um and not unlimited budgets and mm -hmm. that is an unfortunate reality yeah and mr baleni the argument that's always come from the unions as well is that we shouldn't even be considering um epw jobs as decent jobs and i see um dennis george earlier on as well making a similar point the the, the reality Alfred, is that um if there were better um, uh, other measures to create jobs which are paying a decent salary would have opted for that. Uh, so I, I normally say, if you say no to this, bring an alternative. Uh, other than, if there's no alternative, uh, government can't fold its hands and allow people to suffer in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, Deputy Minister? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Aldrin. In fact, when EPWP uh, was launched, the program, it, it was not necessarily a public um, employment as in the in the true sense of employment. It mm -hmm. was more of the poverty um, alleviation program. Uh, it was targeted. It was targeting those households where there is not one person uh, be able to. Pay. It was meant to ensure that nobody just goes uh, to bed uh, on an empty stomach. Mm -hmm. But as as time went by, um, it has grown because we then looked at the pos potential it has to to build skills, uh, and hence you find people who come in over a period of time get to be trained in these kinds of projects. In fact, if we look at uh, what the, the best example for me on, on, the, on the EPWP or community works programs is the fighting, uh, fighting fire, the mm -hmm. firefighting program. Those uh, people in their multitudes have been trained. In as much as municipalities will have their own uh, firefighting teams, which are small, because municipalities are in themselves uh, not wouldn't be able to have that army of people. But the, the extent to which that program has grown and has been good, when um, was it Brazil had the, the, the trouble with water? I mean, with uh, fire, mm -hmm. they were taken en masse to go and assist. So for me, it means those are people who are truly well-trained. They are our soldiers now, the stage they are in. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are uh, being carried through by the Department of um, Envir uh, uh, Environmental Affairs. So I'm saying we need to look at those pro projects in a manner that says we can have some level of sustainability in some, but in some, we can use them to train uh, people, uh, to skill them, and to release them to uh, the market. Mm -hmm. But I'm worried, Aldrin, because um, we, we, we tend to look at um, the issue of, uh, the people will say there's corruption also in that program. Yeah. Uh, in terms of what uh, is happening at, at uh, local government level, the issues of nepotism. But the, for me, those are minor issues. They, they, they are major, but they are minor. They mm -hmm. are minor in, in that still, even if you say it's nepotism, the people who would be employed 
we would be people who have been unemployed. Um, it's just that because of the magnitude of the challenge, uh, each person is looking at another one who's got the opportunity. Why didn't I have the opportunity? Mm -hmm. If we could uh, just run that uh, where the partnerships now come in, in a manner that says to this community, here is an opportunity amongst yourselves, choose. That's what I've been preaching. Amongst yourselves, you know each other as this community. Choose those families that you know. Uh, they are, they are, there's nobody, there's nothing, there's nothing to put on the table. Mm -hmm. And when you run the program in that fashion, then everybody knows why so-and-so is there. They were chosen openly, transparently. That's all we need is to run them in a transparent manner uh, mm -hmm. to deal with the, with the corruption, uh, so-called corruption challenge. For mm -hmm. me, the, the, the corruption that we very silent about. You know, we, we gloat around the 2010 um, projects. Yeah, the stadia. But, but yes, the stadia and, and, and all that came with it. But when you look at the amounts that were involved in that kind of corruption, we seem to not be so serious. And, and that's what worries me, that we, we, we tend to mix um, issues of corruption and handle them in a manner that does not send a clear message that corruption is corruption and we must deal with it um, as it as it uh, rears its ugly head. Mm -hmm. So I, I do want us to 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 also understand that we we tend to make corruption a a government issue when in fact it is companies private companies that go in cahoots with public servants where there would be uh, corrupt uh, tendencies uh, in government and therefore we need to ensure that um, we we deal with 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 corruption uh, there's a term about tigers and and flies we just deal with corruption as corruption and mm -hmm. uh, wherever it it rests, it's ugly yet, because I always say it takes two to tango in that yes. act of corruption. Yeah. There's a public program, there's a private uh, investor or company that goes in cahoots mm -hmm. uh, with this public uh, servant. So yeah. we, we need to deal with both of them. Uh, Deputy Minister, is it really an issue of, of, of just having, you have the corruptor and the corruptee, or is it a, about actually an environment that has been created to enable that corruption to thrive? And the points that were made earlier on about um, how the state, for instance, was hollowed out of its capacity and um, how skills, uh, how there was an issue around the skills as well, is because an environment for that had been created, isn't it? If, if you look at um, our laws, nobody finds fault with, with the laws mm -hmm. uh, in terms of that environment that we're talking about. Uh, we have laws uh, that govern procurement, for example, and the processes and the systems and nobody can point there in that law to say, um, here is a clause that promotes uh, corruption uh, or that allows corruption to thrive. For me, the, the critical issue is um, what is termed um, consequence management. Yes. Is that when we find this person, um, the, the laws, again, especially for the public servant, uh, they, they make them to be elusive to consequence management. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the drive that we are taking as government to, to, to tighten that gap that mm -hmm. is there uh, in terms of uh, dealing with the corruption. But yeah. also, I do want to say, even in private sector, we, we must encourage a uh, private sector to not tolerate it 
and to stop doing it. Mm -hmm. to ensure ethical business principles. Mm -hmm. You know, some companies, um, I, I heard the other day uh, from, from, from one of my nieces saying, the company that employs her, if, if you are caught uh, in, a, in, a, in, in an ethical uh, business, an, unethical business uh, transaction mm -hmm. or activity uh, they they have signed to say we, we don't go through the disciplinary processes that long thing uh, you, you you just have to go they okay. they make it so easy for one who has heard to to leave that's what we must do in the public service okay we must yeah. make it easy to, 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 to kick out the corrupt elements. Because again, you will find that the, the corrupt elements are few, but because mm -hmm. they, 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 the act in itself is so unacceptable, and we tend to generalize when we talk about it, we find that the whole public service is painted, uh, and government therefore is painted with, a, with that uh, bad brush and mm -hmm. we need to to stop brushing and to yeah. target to be targeted in our approach in dealing with corruption sure uh, dr Mahetla, just uh, quickly on that particular point when the president always speaks he speaks of an ethical state uh, uh, he speaks yes of a, of, a, of a capable state but also that it must be an ethical state at the same time and just listening into what the deputy minister have to say what's your take on that You know, I think if you're saying we're going to assess the state in terms of its ability to serve the people, then those two things are the same. They yeah. only diverge if you think somehow you can have, you know, if, if you think, um, you know, for instance, that the apartheid state was efficient but unethical. So I think in a democracy, I don't think you can necessarily, I, I really think you shouldn't separate those things. The part of saying, is it a capable state is, is it meeting the needs of the constituency of the ruling party. And I would argue that one of the reasons we've been saying that state capture is unethical is because it precisely prevented the state from meeting the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. Okay, and let's go to this question here. I've got a question here from Mpukulo, who says, which sectors or industries can be targeted to achieve that fine balance between state programs, galvanizing employment relative to opening up industries for private sector to participate and create uh, sustained employment. Dr. Mahatla, would you like to take that? Sure. Um, you know, I think, I, you know, I, I just think, let's be clear. Um, and I'm not sure I'm, I'm completely getting the question, but um, that if what we're really saying is if you've been in the private sector, and they say so, I think, in the framing for this whole symposium, of course, the private sector has to make money. One of the problems with trying to provide infrastructure for people who can't pay is that you can lose that aspect of accountability. Um, and in that context, so to me, that's the biggest problem, is that to do PPPs for the low-income group tends to mean either that you are uh, Dr. Um, Mahat, let me quickly hold that yeah. point. Um, there's somebody's mic that's on, and um, there is noise coming in, uh, bleeding through their mics. Uh, so please, everyone, just a reminder again, please keep your mics on mute, unless if we are speaking to you. Okay, Dr. Mahat? Right. So, yeah, so no, what I was trying to say is that the issue with PPPs is that um, there's always a risk that if the government is just subsidizing, then the private sector may be tempted to cut corners and provide less cost because the people who are using the infrastructure are not actually, you know, controlling the, the income stream. And mm -hmm. we've seen that most visibly in corrections in the prisons. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, if, um, if you don't, if government doesn't provide a subsidy, they may not get the infrastructure at all. So I think that to me, that's the critical thing with PPPs. And one of the things with EPWP and particularly community work programs is that you're precisely trying to serve the poorest communities 
where they can't pay. So those may be the hardest ones to get a PPP in. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try. And there are some things like building schools and things that it might be possible to have at least some labor intensive elements where in effect, the PPP takes the form almost of a lease. So the school, ba you know, basically the private sector uh, builds it and then turns it over to the state and the state pays for it over a period of time. Yeah. But it's actually quite hard for these sort of small scale labor intensive, you know, the kinds of things Miriam was saying about maintenance, mm -hmm. those kinds of projects, it is quite hard, I would argue, to do PPPs. It's much easier where you're supplying something like bulk infrastructure where you know how you're going to pay um, mm -hmm. in terms of either major customers or the taxpayer. Um, then it is trying to do very, de you know, small scale localized projects that are better for um, EPWP and also for community employment schemes. Mm. Are there forms of incentives that you can use to encourage that? I mean, yes, you can subsidize things. I just think that, you know, we have to take into account we are one of the most unequal countries in the world. Mm -hmm. And under apartheid, infrastructure was so skewed that the biggest backlogs are precisely in the poorest areas. Mm -hmm. And to incentivize people to invest there is just difficult because people genuinely cannot pay. And I mean, you can see it if you look at, you know, the malaise affecting many small towns is that they actually get virtually no income from services. And it's not because people aren't paying what they owe, it's because they actually don't owe under the various policies because their household incomes are too low. Mm. And I think that makes it just, you know, the part, we're trying to get into a virtuous cycle where we give them the infrastructure that enables them to engage better with the economy as well as to things like education and healthcare. And that in turn, they become more productive, their incomes go up over time they can pay. But we have to kickstart it by subsidizing infrastructure. And that's always yeah. been one of our hardest challenges around getting infrastructure to the majority of the population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, uh, Prof, uh, Prof Borat, the other issue is um, what Gauteng has been complaining about in terms of the number of people moving into the province as well as migration and uh, how Gauteng is taking a knock because of that. But then you find the reason that people are moving away from these rural townships is because there's absolutely nothing that's happening there. Hi, Prof. Sorry. Um, Hi, sorry, my unmute wasn't working. Um, yeah, so I think, again, um, if if you are going to twin um, an infrastructure build program to patterns of urbanization, then that's the goal of policy, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, again, I come back to my point. I think we are too programmatic in the way that we're thinking about uh, um, uh, let's call it the public employment schemes. We don't seem to have. So the point you're making is, if there's, if if you have a design strategy or policy intervention for mm -hmm. which the goal of infrastructure build program is, let's let's look at patterns of urbanisation and wherever wherever those are the greatest and whichever urban centres, that's where we focus um, uh, infrastructure build through public employment schemes, and that's fine, right? Mm -hmm. But your problem is once you add that to poverty relief, to employment creation, and then we've got a little bit of sort of inclusive growth and um, uh, sort of uh, big bulk infrastructure, and then it's, frankly speaking, it's a mess, right? Because then you've got this diverse set of infrastructure without coherence, and that's what I worry about. I mean, you can I think urbanization is a really good idea, right? I mean, let me give you another example. If you think one of the key things is to provide infrastructure to support um, ECD facilities, early childhood development through to schooling. We know that we have large numbers of Kuntal One schools that don't have water, that don't mm -hmm. have access to um, all sorts of infrastructure. You could design your public works or community works program specifically with that in mind, sort of a school-based infrastructure program. Mm -hmm. But that has to have coherence, right? Otherwise, it spread too thinly, and in fact, it spread unevenly. And then the kinds of outcomes you get are are, are really mm -hmm. unclear from the outset because you haven't designed it properly. What do you mean by coherence? So when I say coherence, what you're saying, uh, uh, myself, Miriam, and uh, Neva were talking about. Well, what is 
can we not design a public works program that has, and the suggestion was, it doesn't have to be that, has mm -hmm. coherence within an inclusive growth trajectory. So if your inclusive growth uh, goals, uh, Maria mentioned the NDP, have a specific set of criteria, then public works programs need to put into that, rather than let's do a little bit of this, let's, do, let's focus on schools, okay. and let's do a little bit of organization, and, and then you lack coherence. So no. choose your goal, choose the criteria, and, and go from there. Yes. Actually, so, um, wasn't it Miriam also... suggested that it should be decentralized? Okay, sorry, is that, is that, uh, uh, is that Dr. Miriam? Yeah, can I come okay. in? Sure. Yeah. So I know it might appear that it's a bit of a fish and chips, but actually um, the specific um, areas that uh here i'll put my video on the specific areas that um where epwp focuses uh, it really wasn't fish and chips they they were you know like ecd zero to four i know that uh i led enormous amounts of work when i was at hsrc uh, years ago um to get focus on some of these areas we we looked at where the main mm -hmm. service delivery gaps were and where the overlap could be with epwp and these programs align perfectly to what those the, the biggest service delivery gaps are. So, you know, and, and that that in this case is uh, servicing children under age four. Uh, that has probably mm -hmm. the biggest development impact that there can be is a huge job creator was underserviced. Um, the home based care health. Uh, I forget what the program's called, but. Um, the home community uh, health care. Um, and the CWP ended up being these services. In fact, the, there was a there was a big overlap. I think initially when Kate Phillip was working on it, she thought it would, there would be a lot of fencing and that kind of thing. But it turned out that a lot of what people applied for were these programs. So then when the deputy minister says, oh, but Dr. Altman, um, you know, you're wrong. Uh, we uh, we've actually deployed people to schools, that's a very well considered and designed, I'm very glad to be corrected because I was actually making the point that this should be uh, a critical service delivery um, area that could overlap with e EPWP very well and opportunity that's there um, that would uh, help to keep the economy going and uh, avoid further lockdowns. Um, I would love to see, as I said, more support to um, companies, even if it's a roaming, maybe mobile service. Um, you know, as an example, um, you know, I've been sitting on the Tiger Brands Foundation board since it was uh, started and we deliver school breakfast. So we, we work very closely with the National School Nutrition Program and DBE. And we, uh, we train youth to use mobile applications to take pictures of, of the food, both ours and and the and the uh, Department of Education's um, and report in on a daily basis as to uh, mm -hmm. how the program's going. That's exactly the kind of thing that um, the COVID response should um, be doing. So we unfortunately, can get Dr. Altman, line there isn't great. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. Anyway, I think that this is very well aligned. Actually, I, I don't think it's a random thing at all. I really don't. I, th I think it's actually very well considered and targeted. It just needs to get stronger and expand more. And it's very much part of an inclusive growth strategy. Um, hello? I'm not sure if I'm off or everybody else is off. No, I think we've lost our chair. Okay. Mm. Oh, again. Um. Where is uh, we've lost him again. It's his work. Alden. Poor Alden. Maybe why is there? Let me check and let me check Aldrin. <laughs> Uh, maybe this is something that we should work on as a country to make sure that we've got better connection. <laughs> I, 
absolutely. Um, Deputy absolutely Minister, right. there's a question from um, Sandy Boyer. I'm here. Anyone? Somebody? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, Deputy Minister, can you hear me? Can hear you now. Okay, thank you so much. So, okay, so as we concluding, here's a question here from um, Sandy Boyer. Um, sorry, perhaps I have misunderstood, but what is the content of the future program EPWP? What is the main axis? Is this program articulated with concepts of resilience to climate change? Uh, let let me appreciate that question from uh, our participant and indicate that uh, as the Department of Public Works, we coordinate all departments uh, implementing EPWP. Each department has a stream on which it uh, applies and employs each, each, uh, the EPWP program. Uh, from my side or from our side, we co coordinate those departments and collate the information as to which department is doing uh, what. One mm -hmm. example is that on environment, there's working for water, there's working for uh, fire. Is uh, in 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 other departments like health, you have the community health workers in other departments like uh, education now we have realized the need and we have initiated uh, working with education the need for them to have um, more or less per school about five people who, who must um, now that the screening taking place when learners arrive must screen uh, learners rec make a record of who came in, what was the temperature and all that. So they work as a team in each of the, the schools throughout mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. um, we have in municipalities, because we also work with municipalities, coordinate them, they have those people who would be cleaning um, the alien trees, the alien plants, they work with environment, but they also work with the uh, municipalities in their parks and and those kinds of areas. Uh, it, it, and and I'm therefore kind of, kind of saying each department identifies its need, and uh, and then uh, they are allocated funds to employ people for EPWP, and all we do is to coordinate. Uh, they are reporting so that we are able to say in this financial year, this program has produced so many jobs. Mm. That's our primary responsibility. But also, because we are a Department of Public Works, we also have our own programs as a Department of Public Works, wherein we then um, employ these people. And these are the ones I am saying. We will partner with... Uh, the skilled uh, and youth entrance in in the job market together with uh, experienced uh, retired uh, um, specialists in the field of the built environment we will uh, work with communities and local government in the built environment for them to maintain first and foremost our existing buildings mm -hmm. and infrastructure that's already there. But more than that, to ensure that some of the projects, uh, like your road walkways along the streets, um, those small projects we utilize to ensure that 
um, we skill people, the unskilled labor, so that when they leave the job, the, the, the project, they are easily uh, acceptable in the job market. So okay. uh, it's it's a it's a it's a it's an in transit kind of um, program because you come in you go out. Uh, mm. It's not like you are employed here as EPWP. Sure, uh, it's an entry minutes. and an exit. On that, are you able as um, as the department to track down what happened to somebody who have gone through this particular program? Yes, we, we are. You are able to In do that. In actual fact, we had uh, last year, no, at the beginning of this year, uh, we had a, a, a symposium type where we called in the NPOs we work with and uh, leadership uh, that works with EPWP because we wanted to ensure that we, we they now understand that we would want to track each and every person who comes into the program and therefore recording of that kind of detail and ensuring that we build a case for EPWP. We must be able at some point to say we were able to, to take into EPWP in, the, in, in Department X so many people and of those, so many are in the uh, job market already. Mm. Yeah, the formal job market. Okay, we're going to um, get closing remarks. Unfortunately, a minute each, please. Only have like eight minutes left here. Let's start off with uh, Dr. Macheta again. Yeah, so I, I just want to say I, I'm grateful for everybody's comments. I thought it was very interesting. I do think that what comes out of this is um, how difficult it is to talk about transformatory infrastructure and how important it is, as I think Haroon said, to come up with a programmatic approach that says very consistently, how do we ensure that as we do this build program, we actually transform the economy to make it more equitable, more inclusive, more like the society we all want to live in. Thanks. Okay, thank you much, Dr. Um, Balin. Thanks uh, to the panelists and uh, facilitator. Uh, my, my take really is that um, we will be failing the people of South Africa and we will be failing the constitution which we have committed itself. If you look at chapter two, uh, the dignity of each and every mm -hmm. person who's living in the country. So unemployment takes away that dignity. We need to restore people's dignity. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Boro. Thanks. Um, just four points in conclusion. I, mean, I think the original point, we need to figure out where and WP is going to an inclusive growth country and be very specific about it. We have to mm -hmm. be clear, secondly, about converting work opportunities into long-term employment outcomes and how do we build that bridge. Thirdly, we have to take the problem of leakages or rent-seeking or corruption and to take that seriously. And I think the only way to take it seriously to, and to set it up um, is to ensure that you have the system. Okay, Professor Borat, um, we lost you there for a sec. Professor Borat still there? Okay. Um, can you hear me? Go, sure, we can hear you now. You you can go ahead. Um, so again, I was just saying four four points for me really is figure out where you fit with the mm -hmm. Field development is key there. I agree with the David Minister. Uh, but we have to keep an eye on it in terms of uh, renting opportunities. 
yeah. finally is one way to keep an eye on it, but also to monitor, to to sort of keep a clear sense of of the direction we're taking with uh, public works programs to have an appropriate monitoring evaluation system. Sure. Okay, thank you so much for that, Prof. And uh, Dr. Altman, um, you get the opportunity to sweep. <laughs> uh, so, um, I would agree with everything that Harun said uh, just now, so I won't repeat it. And I think that the biggest opportunity within this is in the, in the area of social services and in greater cooperation, it's not just with the private sector, but with um, you know, the strengthening of community based organizations and um, nonprofits um, through innovative um, approaches like social franchising, as an example. So, getting that capacity in place. And then, just in closing, if I can just remind people that the NPC has just issued uh, papers on um, strengthening infrastructure delivery and on state on enterprise. And it may not have been the main topic of today, but I do hope that people will share them and will um, have a look and give us feedback, um, including to our uh, friends in government. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Deputy Minister, um, your turn. Thank you so much for this as well, Deputy Minister. Uh, thank you, thank you, Adrian. Thanks to you first. Um, I think you were a, a, a very good uh, facilitator and your person. I do understand the, 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 the need for us to beef up our um, communication infrastructure, uh, especially that we've been losing sure. you so many times. Uh, but it's not ah. your making, it's, it's the system. <laughs> Um, to also thank the, the, the um, uh, panelists, I think they took the task very seriously and have really raised uh, thought-provoking ideas uh, mm. which will help us as government to restructure and um, enhance the programs we're driving. But um, indeed, the words that I used initially, this is for all of us. It's a duty we have uh, accepted in, in the Constitution when we said we will work to improve the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. When we were saying so, it meant everybody must be uh, productive where they are uh, to the best they could be. And, and therefore, that talks truly to uh, employment uh, creation. We will continue to work with uh, communities, with leadership in private uh, sector. Um, we, we really do need those uh, partnerships, uh, public-private partnerships, but working, of course, with our NPOs. And currently, in fact, our EPWP program is driven by NPOs. We contract NPOs and they roll it uh, on the ground. My, mine is to thank everyone who have participated, even those uh, who are connected elsewhere, who have been writing comments. We take note of those comments, and uh, as we move along, we will work to improve. Uh, ours is to ensure that um, uh, employment is part of uh, inclusive growth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Minister. From me, Aldrin Simpier, the rest of the team, Abo Boitumelo, who are working behind the scenes, and Nombulelo as well, putting this together. Really appreciate it and appreciate your time and all the contributions as well. And the great pleasure speaking to the panelists that we have today. And Minister, like you said, let's make sure that everyone becomes productive. Goodbye, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.